Amen. Praise God. Well, we won't keep you much longer. Uh, I, I'll, I'll breeze through real quick um, and, uh, and hit these points really fast. But um, uh, in Acts, turn with me to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. And let's read it together. It says this, and it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and the, to fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul and many wonders. Everybody say many wonders. And signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much. I thank you for all these leaders. We thank you for what Pastor Callie was, was uh, exhorting us to do, Lord Jesus. Lord, if we just bring one, God, Lord, uh, one life, God, this is all for the one, Lord. And so I just pray that you'd speak to us this morning about why this even matters, God. Why are we here, Lord? What, why are we the church? And so, Lord, I pray that you'd just reveal this to us this morning, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, I need you too. Give me $500. Man, I'm just going to start doing that, you know. Uh, Ivan, Ivan does that, so I'm going to do that. Give me $500 right now. <laughs> In Acts chapter 2, uh, they had a revival, right? The, the power of God came, like the fire of God in the upper room. They literally had flames, and, and there's wind blowing, and the Holy Spirit fills them. And it's like, it's like the most epic, amazing thing ever. And then Peter starts preaching to these people who are gathering to just thought, you know, these, they thought they were drunk, they thought they were crazy, but Peter just starts preaching to these, these people out here that were gathering in the street. And 3,000 people get saved. And, and talk, talk, talk about something, I mean, you know, as, as you know, Pastor Cal and I meet all the time, you know, with the staff, and we're, you know, we want to we be as efficient as we can to just to have a good structure here and be organized. But let me tell you something. I can't imagine 3,000 people getting saved and not expecting it. What do you do with these people? I mean, you know what I'm saying? They, I mean, they, it was like they, they, they weren't prepared. I mean, I, 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 they didn't have a prepared structure. But let me tell you something. They had spent three years with Jesus and they had prepared hearts. So many times we're so worried about having a prepared structure, but God's first and foremost looking for a, for a prepared man or a prepared woman. He wants your heart. Now, now, prepared doesn't mean perfect. He's not, it's too many times we don't serve God because we're waiting to be perfect. God, God just wants you to have a prepared heart. A prepared heart says, yes, God, I'll, I'll be obedient right now. I'll, be, I'll say yes to you right now. I'll throw my life into it. I'll start a group. I'll go to a group. I don't know those people, but I'll get in there and get to know those people. Amen? I'll go. I have a prepared heart. I'll, I'll say yes, God. And, and we see we have these disciples here. 3,000 people get saved, and they're prepared in their hearts. I, they, they, they hadn't gone to a conference and learned some great strategy on how to disciple 3,000 people. They had seen Jesus, and then they just started doing it. And so this passage that we just read in verse 42 picks up on what happens right after that mass evangelism. Right after those 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus, what happened? Well, this happened. So that they, right after that, they devoted, these people who got saved, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayers. Amazing. That is a, that is a one verse uh, uh, um, explanation about, uh, on why we need the, the community of Jesus. I titled the message, Why We Need Community, but, but, but really, uh, you can get community anywhere. How many you know that? Uh, you can join a club and get community. But, but the, 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 the true community, the true fellowship is is in Christ. As a believer, you can go make buds anywhere. You know, and, and, and that's, that's fine. That's whatever, as long as they're not dragging you down and, and causing you to, to uh, uh, um, deny Jesus with, with, with your life. But, but you can make friends anywhere. The, the church is something wholly unique. 
And I asked the Holy Spirit for help today because I think this is so, it's so vital, we, we miss it. So, somewhere along the way, you know, in church history, there's amazing things that have happened throughout church history. And we know there's some really not so good things that have happened throughout church history. What, what, one of the negative things is that, that we lost, we lost to a certain degree this, this Acts 242 community. Now, it's there. It's throughout the world right now, right? I mean, you will find every city you go to, all throughout the world, that there is a group of believers who are really doing this fully. And, and we will always be failing in this to some extent. But, but right now, the, the state of the American church, the state of the Western church, is not really fully doing this. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would convict us this morning of going, God, you know, God show us what true Christian community looks like. It means a sharing of, of your life with one another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who is amazing, uh, he, 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 and I, I want, before I get into the points, I, I wanted to start and preface it with this. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he's, uh, I've shared a story before, but he was the guy who stood up to Hitler. He was a pastor. He actually ended up um, being involved in the, um, the attempt against Hitler's life. Uh, and he basically was a pastor and a, and a spy uh, during World War II. He was awesome. And, uh, and he, he was amazing. I mean, like, and actually, this guy was a pacifist. You know, he, he wasn't like, this guy's not like a warrior kind of a dude. I mean, he literally would just, he saw the evil, he saw the wickedness, and he stood up to it. And so there's, there's for you, there's something, what, what, what are we called to stand up to, right? Well, he had an incredible revelation on, on Christian community. He wrote a book called Life Together, and it's, it's a classic on this. But, but he says this, and I'm, I'm going to read just a little bit from it. So just, I, I know it's hard with just kind of hearing it audibly, but uh, try, try, try to get with me. I'm, I'm just going to read it. I'll, I'll read it slow and kind of re repeat it. But he said, one is a brother or sister to another only through Jesus Christ. I am a brother or sister to another person through what Jesus has done for me and to me. And others have become brothers and sisters to me through what Christ Jesus has done for them and to them. The fact that we are brothers and sisters only through Jesus Christ is of immeasurable significance. Let me say that again. The fact that we are brothers and sisters only through Jesus Christ is of immeasurable significance. Therefore, the other who comes face to face with me earnestly and devoutly seeking community is not the brother and sister with, with whom I am to relate to in the community. My brother or sister instead, my brother or sister is instead that other person who has been redeemed by Christ, absolved from sin, and called to faith and eternal life. What persons are in themselves as Christians in their inwardness and piety cannot constitute the basis of our community, which is determined by what those persons are in terms of Christ. What he's saying here, he's saying that literally when I, when I come into contact with Chris daily, He's a believer in Jesus, okay? And, and he's also just a good guy. So I could, as Jack, who is a good guy, praise the Lord, I could just relate to Chris as a good guy. We could just be two good guys who happen to, to love Jesus. Okay, that, that could be our relationship. And that would be a pretty good relationship. And, you know, we could, you know, like pray with one another every once in a while and, you know, just kind of talk about God things every once in a while. We, you know, we may not even get to that topic, but we can just be buds. Or, or and, and this, and, and let me say something. We don't do this perfectly. This is a process we'll have to grow for the rest of our life. And I, I, I ask the Holy Spirit will give us awareness from this from now on. Or I, I could go to Chris and say, I'm not just supposed to relate to Chris. Because we're in the body of Christ, I'm relating to Christ in Chris. The reason I'm Chris's brother is not just because we both call ourselves Christians. We are brothers because literally Jesus has done the same thing for him that Jesus has done for me. We might have been forgiven of different things. We might have slightly different stories, slightly different skin. But Jesus, slightly different hair situation. For those of you who can't see him, he's bald. But Jesus has done the same thing for us. I relate to him 
through Christ. Let me put it this another way. All of my interactions with you should be through the person of Christ. What I say to you, what I think about you, what I'm willing to do for you should be through the lens of Jesus. In other words, Christian community, the difference between Christian community is that we are relating to one another through the person of Jesus Christ, what he has done for us and what he is doing in us. That's amazing. You can't get that at the golf club. You can't get that at some mom association, which is great. You can get friends there. Do it. Go play golf. Go meet moms. But you cannot get Christian, Christian community except in the, the church of the living God, which we know, of course, isn't dependent on this walls. You are the church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are the living, breathing body of Christ. Literally, we are his body in the world. As we talked about last week, uh, uh, God, uh, for those of you who weren't here, I was having a, I was having a tough day uh, pacing back and forth here in prayer. Miss Linda was here, and, uh, and the Lord said, go have Miss Linda pray for you. Well, I wasn't really in the mood to have anybody pray for me. I just wanted God to pray for me. And, uh, and uh, it's like, God, we got this. We're good. He's like, no, shut up. Go over there. And, uh, and so, so I went, and I, I had, I had uh, um, Miss Linda pray for me. And, and, and it was amazing and powerful. It was exactly what I needed. And, and later on, the Lord, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Jack, I could tell you were struggling. And I wanted to pray for you, but I needed hands. I needed hands. See, see literally, the, we are the hands and the feet of Jesus. That's not just a sweet thing we say that's cute. Oh, let's go help people. No, no, no. Look, literally, Jesus cannot, cannot fully do what he wants to do in the earth without you. Now, Jesus can do what he wants to do when he wants to do it, okay? He's sovereign. He appears to people in the Middle East all the time. He's doing it right now, okay? He's a sovereign God. But in his sovereignty, he has made you a vital part of what he wants to do in the earth. So, the, well, the way we do that is through community. So in Acts chapter 2, four, four, four things that uh, characteristics of community. I, I, I need you. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. Number one, I need you to teach me. Say, I need you to teach me. And it says here, first and foremost, in verse 42, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is just the word of God, okay? The word of God. You know, uh, um, as pastors, we, I was talking to Peyton about this morning. I, I want to be careful, and all of us are, as pastors on this team, we, we tremble about teaching the word and, and sharing this with you because you know, it, it's, it's easy to just make this about motivational speaking and throw Jesus in and a scripture in for it to sound biblical, okay? No, 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 we, we want, you need this. You don't need me, right, like, like, like just the things that I say. You need the word of God, okay? And so, so the word of God is so vital. The word of God is powerful. It's sharper than, than any two-edged sword, amen, right? And if you're not in the word, you need to get in the word, Okay? Yeah, and I'm telling you, you, I know, if you exist, if you're breathing in this room, you need to be reading the Bible more, okay? Uh, um, I don't care how much you're reading it. You need to be reading it more. Uh, if you have a belly button and breath in your lungs right now, amen, you need to read the Bible more. But I need you to teach me. The reason we need community is because we can't, we can't understand the Word of God without the Spirit of God. But we also cannot understand the word of God without the people of God. I need you to teach me. This, of course, is a practical thing. You know, uh, um, uh, you know Brother James, I was talking to Chris this morning. You know, he's working on the RV, and, and Brother James is teaching himself about the RV. I don't know anything about RVs, okay? And, and that's one amazing thing about Christian community is that, is that you have brothers and sisters in Christ who just know practical things you don't know, Right? My brother David knows how to fix cars. Like, I don't know how to fix cars. You know what I mean? I know nothing about cars. I can play the keyboard, right? And so, how many know in, in church, uh, the body of Christ, we help each other practically. We can teach each other practical things. But th there's, a deeper, there's a deeper significance to this. And, and that's that I need you to teach me what Jesus is like. I need you to teach me how to understand this. 
You might not be a scholar. I'm not a scholar. But, but, but God has revealed something to you that he hasn't quite revealed to me in the same way. How, how many of you have experienced that? You're around, you're around a believer, and they have like this, this passion for winning souls. It's like they just got it in their head, and they, they, they can teach all the scriptures on that, and they understand it really well. I need to be hanging out around that person. And, and I, I need to be hanging out around the, the uh, exposed to the person who really understands the, the heart of the Father. And, and I, I need to be around the person who God's really revealed to them about holiness and righteousness. And whenever I'm, whenever I'm acting like an idiot, I get convicted when I'm around them. We need one another. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you to teach me. I need you to teach me. You know, the reason there's a lot of deception right now is because people... Well, this is what Christians do. We think, we think that just me, the Bible, and a prayer closet is enough. It's not enough. Christianity is not an individual religion. It's a, it's a community. It's a, living, it's a living body of Christ, okay? Right? And so we, we need to be seeking God alone. But, but, but you, if you're just by yourself, if you don't have community, you'll get an error, Right? Well, this is what happens, and I'll move on from this in one second, but you'll have, you have your pet thing that you're really excited about, right? Okay? This doctrine that God's revealed to you. And, and you go around, you feed it, and you, you, you talk to it, it's your little pet, and, and it's the only thing you focus on, and you're not in a community. That pet's going to become a monster one day. <laughs> called deception. Because you're so obsessed with this one thing in the Bible, and it's all you care about, and, and, and outside of community, outside of somebody going, hey, Jack, that's not, I don't think that's right, you know, or let's talk about that. You, you're going too far to this end, amen? Um, um, Martin Luther said that, that, that truth is like a really tall horse, that when you get on top of it, you fall off to the other side every time. You know, we tend to overcorrect. We get on the horse and we fall off to the left, or we overcorrect and fall over to the right. And, and we need people to keep us balance and in the truth. I need you to teach me. When you see preachers and people going off the rails, it's because they didn't have people. They were like a rock, they were these rock star teachers or whatever, and everyone just thought they knew everything. And then they fall because they didn't have anybody who knew more than them. Saying that's not right, that's wrong, and, and we all need that. Turn to your neighbor and say, I need you. So, so I need you to teach me. Number two, I, I need you to know me. I need you to know me. It says that they devote themselves to the, the teaching of the apostles and then to fellowship. Oh, that's a cute word. Isn't that a cute word, fellowship? Man, brothers, let's just go fellowship. Let's go fellowship, man. I love fellowship, man. Fellowship's the best thing ever. I love fellowship. And we eat some food, we fellowship. We eat some food, we fellowship. Fellowship, fellowship. We hear this word so many times that it literally loses all meaning to us. And all of a sudden, fellowship just becomes, uh, I guess it's just hanging out with Christian people and eating casserole. I don't know. What is it? What do, what do we do? What is fellowship? Well, the, the, the Greek word here, the Greek word for fellowship is koinonia, right? And, it, and koinonia is this really, really interesting Hebrew word, uh, 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 Greek word. It, they, they couldn't, we don't have an English word for it. In fact, uh, you know, the, the, the translators uh, had a difficult time uh, translating it. Uh, it's interesting. Paul, when Paul wrote uh, to the Corinthians about giving money for the poor saints in Jerusalem, he stated that they receive, it, they receive a gift and they will glorify God for the fact that they receive the gospel in them. And he said the word, the, the word distribution that he used there was the word koinonia. Okay, so the, the, the word koinonia is not only used for fellowship, it's used for the word distribution, it's, it's used for the word communication, it's also used for the word uh, communion. Koinonia means an intimate giving of myself to another believer. It means fellowship, in this sense, the, of, of, of this verse, is literally saying, that, that I, I don't just spend time with you, I, I get, lay down my life for you. That's what fellowship means. Fellowship is when I hear that my brother or sister is, is in need or struggling. I'm there. 
or, 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 or they're hurting and they're struggling and they call me. I pick up the phone and I talk to them and I, I love them. I spend, that's what fellowship is. It's a giving of Let me tell you also what fellowship is. Fellowship is being open, being, being vulnerable, being transparent. Uh, like what they were talking about CR, that was so powerful. It was annoying of you guys. It's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. There's power in transparency. There's power in saying, I need help. Like, I, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm struggling with this. And that's fellowship. And that's, that's, what, that's what the Bible tells us that they devoted themselves to. The word of God, the truth. They were in the word of God, the truth of God. And they, and they had fellowship. They, they, were, they shared their lives together. Guys, this is, do, do you see how far the Western church has gotten from this? We live in a very individualistic society. I mean, li literally, literally, you can park your car in your garage. You don't even have to talk to your neighbors anymore. In fact, they don't even want to talk to you. They feel awkward when you come to their door. They're like, do I need to shoot you? Like, like. There's literally my neighborhood Facebook page the other day. It, like, like, everybody in my neighborhood has, like, the talk back uh, a door monitor. I was like, I didn't know that existed. So they don't have to open the door. Like, and I get it because crime is, and, and, and because of crime, because of like, you know, just crazy people out there, we need to protect our families, we need to be careful, but, but, but we can't live in fear. We're called to be a counterculture, a counterculture who aren't afraid of people, who aren't going, oh, I can't talk to people. Listen, uh, God said that we're to be a city on a hill. We need to be an alternate Baytown. There needs to be Baytown that everyone knows about, and then there's you. There's, there's the alternate Baytown. There's the real Baytown. The real Baytown is the body of Christ that's walking around this city, sharing the life of Jesus. Sharing the life of Jesus. We're, we're the alternate Baytown. We, we, we need to be a city on a hill, an alternate city, saying this is what Baytown can look like. We don't have to be scared of people. We... we, we, we we, we can love people. We don't have to uh, walk in unforgiveness. We don't have to walk in addiction. We don't have to walk in fear or anxiety or depression. Jesus can set you free. This is what it looks like. An alternate, alternate Baytown. God's called us to fellowship. That's what fellowship is. Of, of us sharing our lives with one another. And so that we can share the life of Jesus with the world. Uh, number, number three, I need, you to, I need you to feed me. It says that they, that they devoted themselves to... The breaking of bread, the breaking of bread. Uh, most of the commentators believe that what they're talking about here is communion. Uh, I, I believe that's what they're talking about as well. Obviously, they, they just, they have meals together. How I many know we just need to hang out, right? We do. We need to just spend time together, right? And fellowship has that in it. It always has that in it. Like, you, like you got to be able to just talk about normal things, right? I'm not saying you have to talk about, like, you know, Greek and Hebrew every time you're around. I'm not talking about that. Laugh. Have fun. We should be the happiest people on the planet. You know what I'm saying? Like, talk about the football game. It's awesome. Whatever. It's great. You know what I'm saying? All I'm saying is f f fellowship includes that. It always includes the fun, happy, and pure, right? But it's got to go deeper than that. And God's called us to go deeper than that. And that's to open up, to share our lives with one another. So number three, we see that, that they broke bread together. So they, they, they just ate meals together. But, but we see that Jesus told them, as often as you meet, do this in remembrance of me. The, the bread and, and, and the wine that represents his body broken for us and his blood shed for us. We have communion down here for you every Sunday. And so during our time of prayer, I would encourage you to come down and take this, this bread and, and this, this juice together, which represents the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus. Um, I, this is really important. This right here is a means of grace. It's literally a means of grace. It's a, communion is a way that God helps you follow Jesus, that God encourages you, that God breathes life into you, that God strengthens you. And we'll say, well, that's really weird. A cracker and a grape juice is going to do that for me? Well, let me tell you something. First of all, we don't get to decide what's weird. We just get to, because you're not God. You just, we're obedient to the scripture, amen? 
And, and, and as I say often, Christianity started with weird. It started with a, uh, a virgin birth and all sorts of weird stuff. It's a supernatural faith. And, and we don't get to decide, right, okay, if there's something that we don't like that we don't do it. No, you, you do it. And, and, and what's, when there's that humility there, you say, God, I, I don't totally understand this, God, but like when I do it out of faith, God does something, that, God honors that, okay? And so, so we don't believe in transubstantiation here, which literally uh, uh, the Protestant evangelicals don't teach that. And basically, that means that whenever you take the, the bread and the wine, that literally, literally you're consuming the body of Christ, that, that it supernaturally turns into the, 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 um, the flesh of Jesus. Okay, so we don't teach that, okay? But, but we do teach that something miraculous does happen when you partake of this, okay? And we do not... You honor it and respect it and, and engage. And, and I wanted to spend some time on this today because I think we just need reminders, amen? This is a means of grace. It said that they took communion together. And when, what's amazing, if, what this reminds us of is that when, when a brother in Christ, they might look completely different than me. He might sound completely different than me from a totally different background than me. When we take communion together, we're reminding ourselves that we're the same body. We're the same body. If, he's, if he gets hurt, I'm hurt. If you get hurt, I'm hurting. I'm going to carry your burdens because we're the same body of Jesus. We're fed by, by, by the Lord's Supper. By his, by his body and by his blood shed for us. And I encourage you to make communion a central, a central part of your life. It's a central part of Christian community. Right? Amen? Go with me? Finally, um, I can't remember my finally. What's my finally, Peyton? I need you to pray for me. Oh, yeah, prayer. I couldn't get to my notes. Prayer is important, right? It said that they, they, they broke bread and they prayed together. They prayed together. This is obvious. Uh, you, you need to be praying more. If you, if, if you have, once again, if you have a belly button this morning, if you exist, if you're a human, you need to be praying more. Amen? You need Jesus. The lack of, pr- a lack of prayer is, just, is basically saying, when we're not praying, we're basically saying, I got this, God. And we know that doesn't work. It never works. The I got this God is really a bad life plan, okay? Prayer says, I need you, God. I need you, God. I can't do this day without you. We're very cavalier about our days. You know, I'm going to my shower. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go. I'm gonna, and no, no one say, God, I can't do this day without you. I need you. And throughout the day, just, just prayer is talking to God, okay? And, and, and being honest with God. So, some of you, you just going to learn how to be honest with God, Right? Guys, like when a girl walks by that you want to do a double take, at, just say, God, there's a girl that's not wearing, it's, it's different what she's wearing, and, and I don't want to look over there, and God, help me. Pray like that. That's prayer. Because she needs Jesus. And then start praying for her. And you don't have to look at her to pray for her. You're good. You said, God, I just I pray for her. And then you just, you just reveal, I think you, she, she's, a, she's a daughter of God who needs to experience you. She, doesn't, she obviously doesn't know who she is. And Lord, I pray right now, God, that you reveal yourself to her, that she would come to you, Jesus. Living a lifestyle that's honest with God, that cries out to God, saying, help, I love you. And so, so prayer, prayer says, help. Pr- prayer says, wow. Prayer says, you're amazing, God. You're just so wonderful. God, I just thank you for who you are today. I, I, you're so good. I thank, I, I thank you that for my wife. I thank you for my kids. And you're, you're, there's thankfulness, amen? And then, there's, of course, there's supplication. God, I need you. Lord, move, uh, uh, heal my relative. God, save my husband. God responds to that, amen? But we don't do it alone. It says that they devoted themselves to prayer as a community. You need to have somebody you're praying with. And... and, and this, this is kind of maybe kind of shocking to us today because I don't think we realize how individualistic we've gotten as a society. 
Obviously, technology has, has done this to a, a great degree. But, but the American uh, culture is, you know, liberty, freedom. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go seize the day. And that's not the gospel. God, 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 God has given us liberty. But, but it's, it's not liberty from restrictions. It, it, it's a liberty to, to, to be obedient to the word of God. Amen? So pray together. Have someone you're praying with, you know? We can connect. You saw, you saw up here, you, and, and you have no excuse now because you see all the groups and you need to go, go sign up one. There's someone who, who can love, you, love on you. Amen? There's someone who can be there for you, okay? And we say, well, there's not really people I like. Well, go, go, go like them. No, 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 no. Let's talk about this for a second. It's the thing, right? Go like them. You know, it's amazing. It will surprise you. If you'll love somebody, they'll become lovable. If you'll love somebody you don't like, they'll become lovable and they'll become more likable. And, uh, but then there's going to be people that you just, you just won't like and it, it's all good and, and you'll just have to just love them by faith for the rest of your life and that's fine too. But, but, there are some people, there are some, there are some relationships here you're missing out on because you think you wouldn't like them. And, and what I'm trying to tell you that today is Christ is hidden in them. Christ is hidden in them. Um, I was in uh, Los Angeles. We went to, um, a couple years ago, to the Azusa Street Revival thing. It was amazing. I went with my, um, my friends, and that morning I woke up in prayer, and I was seeking after God, and I was just, like, really praying, and, and it was good. And uh, I was just really expecting God to do something awesome in me on, on this trip. I wanted God to just encourage me and, and, and fill me up and, and just, you know, stir me up. And, and so it's that morning, and then we, it was the day before the event, and so we ended up having this idea, which was a God idea. Well, we went to the Azusa actual place where the revival was and did, went there. It was really cool, and, and it was about noon at that point. And, and I was just wanting God to fill me up, right? Me, me, me. And it was good. God filled me up and encouraged me. But after that, we're kind of like, hey, what do we do now? And one of my buddies said, hey, let's just go to McDonald's and let's get a bunch of burgers and let's go find some homeless people and just give burgers and just love on people. And I go, okay, that's a good idea. We're Christians. We do that. Okay. I, no, it wasn't a very spiritual decision for me. I was like, he, he, he. You know, the Lord prompted him on that. I was like, let's go do it. And, and so we went. And uh, guys, I'm telling you, it's a long story, but, but we met this guy in McDonald's. I mean, this guy is like the president of homeless people in Los Angeles. <laughs> he was amazing. He knew everybody. Like, he's like, I know where to take you. And, and I mean, he, uh, everyone knew his name. I mean, like, he was amazing. We, we met the guy. If you want to minister to homeless people in Los Angeles, we met the guy to show us how to do that. He knew their names. He knew, he knew who was in, in each tent and everything. And he's helping us out. And he's like, hey, don't mess with these guys. They're, they're, they're preachers. They're, and he's like protecting us. And, and like it was a real area. I mean, like, and we ended up encountering this guy. This homeless guy walked up to us. And I, I'm telling you, he, I, I, could, I literally could smell him five feet away. I mean, it was, you could tell like he was just, and it was raining. It was chilly that day. And he was wet. He was drinking a out of a styrofoam cup with a little bit of coffee left out of the trash can. I mean, it was like crazy. And we went up to him, and, and, uh, and we just started loving on him. Hey, man, how are you doing? What's your name? And he couldn't tell me his name. And he just started mumbling and kind of saying, like, nonsense. And I, I kept on trying to ask him, and I never could get his name. And at that point, we, we prayed for him, but we really didn't know what else to do. We, you know, gave him some food. We prayed for him. And at that point, the kind of time came to an end, and... and because he couldn't really speak to us, and, and we, we ministered to him, and we went back to the car, and I just began to weep. The power of God uh, came in the car, and I heard the Lord say to me, he said, Jack, there's only so far you can go in the prayer closet. There's only so much you can find out about me in the prayer closet. The rest of me is in the streets. The rest of me is out there. The rest of me is in the body of Christ. You can't do this alone. We need other people. We need other people. 
four very quick things I'm not, I'm not even going to spend a whole lot of time on, but I just want to rattle them off. The results of when, when Christian community happens. It, it says that they saw many signs and wonders. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them to all, all need. And day by day, they're breaking bread. And the Lord added to their number. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you the result of true Christian community. When we get this right, when we begin to love one another, when we begin to, to have godly fellowship with one another and, 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 and treat one another through, through Christ, this begins to happen. Number one. The fear of the Lord descends upon us. It says this. It says in verse 43, it says, And awe came upon them. Awe came upon every soul. Let me tell you something. That's a sign of revival. That's a sign that we're doing church right. When I hang around, hang out, hang around another Christian, and we're encouraging one another, and all of a sudden the presence of God comes in, and it's like, I feel the fear of the Lord. It's that reverence of God. The reverence of God came upon the people. It's what Pastor Kylie was talking about. A fear of the Lord. We, we, we need that to return to the body of Christ. And a mark of a church that's doing this well is that the fear of the Lord is there. It says here. It's the Bible. That's what it says. Number two, it says signs and wonders. Signs and wonders were happening. When, when, when we begin to walk with one another as a true Christian community, you're going to see signs and wonders and miracles begin to happen. It's activated in our lives. Uh, come up here to these small groups. Join some of these small groups. Begin to have that activate in your life. With Miss Pam and, and Nikki and Wes, uh, uh, signs and wonders begin to, to happen. Number three, what happens as a result of true Christian community? Radical generosity. It's a, the, radical. They begin to sell everything they have and give everything. It's like, oh, oh you, you need help with your car payment? I'll, I'll help you with your car payment. Uh, you, you need this? I, I'll give you this. So they literally just had everything in common. It was just this crazy it was radical. What can do that? Only Jesus can do that in you. We can't do that just hanging out and chatting up. Oh, but, but when Jesus begins to move in our hearts, when we begin to grow and love one another, radical generosity begins to happen. And finally, uh, supernatural growth. It, it said that the Lord, the Lord added to their number daily. Let me tell you something. We can't grow this church, but God can grow this church. God's going to grow this church. God's going to fill this place to the back wall. And, 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 and if we'll begin to love one another well, serve one another, and, and, and honor the Christ in one another, and, and grow as a community, we're going to reach this city. We're going to reach the city. We're going to be the alternate Baytown walking around the city. Amen? With the light of Jesus. Would you stand up with me? Thank you, Jesus. We love you. You're so good, God. You're so good. We need you, Lord. I just want you to just lift your hands to the Lord just for just a minute here and just say, God, as it's just a simple response saying, God, I thank you that I'm a part of the body of Christ. Can we just thank him? It's a privilege. Man, if, if you put your trust in Jesus, I just want you to say, it's, it, it's so amazing. You are a part of the body of Christ. That's a honor. You get to represent Jesus. Jesus is in you. You are so important. You're so valuable. Jesus, thank you I get to be a part of the body of Christ. Lord, help me. Help me to love, to love my brothers and sisters in a deeper way. Help me, God, to, to have godly fellowship, Lord. I need you. I need you. I need your people. I need your people. Today, if, uh, if you've never given your life to Jesus, if you want to join this family, if you want to join the family of God, I want to give you an opportunity right now to do that. The Bible makes it very simple. It says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. He is alive right now. He did, he did rise from the dead. He died on a cross for you so your sins could be forgiven, so you could start clean, so, so every bad thing you've done can be washed away. Clean slate today. He loves you. And so you could spend eternity with him in heaven. There's a real heaven. There's a real hell. You will spend eternity in one of those places. And Jesus came so that you could spend eternity with him. He's amazing. If that's you today. If you want to give your life to Jesus, every head, every, every head, uh, head bowed and every eye closed, I just want you to raise your hand all over the place right now. If you say, Jesus, I want to give my life to you. If you're not sure, if you die today that you would go to heaven, if you're not sure about 
your, your eternal destiny. Just raise your hand right now. Jesus wants to come and save you. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hands. Thank you, Jesus. If you raise your hands, I, I, I want to invite you to just take one more step because we're talking about family this morning. We want to give you a hug. We want to love on you today. And if, if you want to make that decision this morning, if you raise your hand, I want right now, I'm going to walk down here to this altar. And I, I, on the count of three, I want you to walk down and I, I want to hug you. And Pastor Callie's going to be down here to hug you as well. And can we give them a huge hand? One, two, three. Come on, walk down right now. Amen. Come on. Give them a huge hand. Amen. Give them a huge hand. Thank you, Jesus. We love you this morning. Amen. If you want to pray this prayer this morning, I want you to repeat after me. We're going to pray with you. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you that you love me. I give my life to you. Save me, Jesus. Forgive me my sins. I declare that you're the Lord of my life. And I believe that you are alive inside of me right now. I will serve you all of my days. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Oh, man, let's give her a hand. Amen. We love you guys.